What's the biggest scam in tech that's deemed acceptable? I'm agreeing with David Fowler, and I'm saying that it's best practices. Why? Because everything has trade-offs, and your context absolutely matters. Let me give some examples so hopefully we can get out of this dogma about best practices. If you're new to my channel, I'm Derek Martin, and I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. This video is brought to you by EventStoreDB, the stream database built from the ground up for event sourcing, CQRS, and event-driven microservices. For more on EventStoreDB, check out the link in the description. The thing with best practices is that they come in different forms. This could be your development process and what the industry deems good best practices, or it could be in the form of code and thinking about different design principles. So to illustrate this, I'm using an older template of ASP.NET Core. If you're unfamiliar, don't worry, I'll explain it. You'll get the gist. But we have our program here with our entry point of main, and we are creating a host builder. Essentially, we just have this uh, web builder for a particular startup for ASP.NET Core. Not that complicated. This is kind of our entry point. But this startup is really where everything gets interesting. So we have our startup class where we inject some iConfiguration. And then we have two methods here. We have configure services, which is called by the runtime ASP.NET Core. It's the one I'm going to call it. It's going to pass in the service collection, which is for dependency injection. And we're just going to register all the different types that we want to use through our web application. Then from here, we have a configure method, which is also called by ASP.NET Core, the runtime. And basically what we're doing here is we're configuring all the different middleware, essentially the pipeline that an HTTP request is going to go through. Now I'm going to show you a newer template to see how this differs, how it kind of changes. So now I have a single file, which is our program CS. This is our entry point, but everything is getting configured for ASP.NET Core directly here. So before we had our startup class, there is no more startup class. We're doing all the definition of registering all the different types we want for dependency injection right here. Then we build our application and we're defining what that pipeline is of all the middleware for HTTP requests. This does exactly the same thing as the other example, but now everything is put together in a single file and it's more procedurally done from top to bottom. Now, when this new template came out, there's a lot of reactions like this. It lacks a separation of concerns. The new template is mixing args, parsing, pipeline setup, DI registration, routing, all in one procedural method without a signature by default. This feels like a violation against the single responsibility principle. Now, this is a really simple example, but if you take single responsibility or separation of concerns really to heart and follow it like the law, then you're not gonna be pragmatic at all. There's trade-offs here. A couple of these trade-offs are just simplicity and useless indirection, especially if that startup class is not called anywhere else except ASP.NET Core's runtime. As David replied, it's just the template added too much indirection for what's fundamentally just procedural code, the configuration and the boot of the application. That's it. Your context matters. This template isn't the best practice. It's just showing a way. It's a template. If you have that startup class and you needed to use it in multiple different locations, then sure, makes sense. If you don't, does it add simplicity and less indirection? If you just had it all in one file like the last template showed? Sure use your context. The number of times I've received comments on my blog, YouTube, Twitter, stating this violates X principle. Okay, great, it does. But sometimes people are aware of the trade-offs related to whatever it is you're applying. Not everything has to be the golden rule that I need to follow this all the time. And that's unfortunately the problem with best practices is that they're viewed that way rather than understanding your context. Here's another example that I like to use because messaging is something I talk about a lot in videos. And this was something done by, I believe, uh, McDonald's' example. I'll have a link in the description to this video. But this is related to reliably publishing events. So if we made some type of state change to our database and we need to then publish an event. So we tried to do this. In their case, it was Kafka, but it took some topic where we're trying to publish an event. And there's some type of failure there. So in their case, what they were doing is they were then using DynamoDB to send that event to Dynamo 
if there was a failure. So that way separately, they'd have some type of Lambda that ultimately is kind of some kind of retry mechanism that pulls that event from Dynamo, and then it can then be the one to persist it to that topic. And then you may read that the best practice is instead, it should be using a transactional outbox, which is this, which is when your service is actually trying to update the state of your database and publish that message to whatever broker you're using, rather what you do is if within the same transaction that you're persisting your state to your database, you're also persisting that event to that same database within that same transaction. Then you can have a separate process, which is a publisher that can pull that event data out of your database and it can be the one to actually send that message to your message broker or your topic. So that first example that was using DynamoDB as a fallback, should they be ashamed themselves because they're not following the best practice? No, there's trade-offs. With the outbox pattern, you are gonna add more load on your database because you're doing more writes and reads to it to persist all that event data to your primary database with those state changes. Their choice in this particular case maybe was to use DynamoDB as a fallback. Maybe in certain situations, because they really critically need that data being published in a correct order, they are using the outbox pattern. Again, context matters, not one solution for everything at all times. Now, another thing that needs to be addressed is this constant comparison to other companies in a positive or negative way that I simply will never understand. The comment usually is something along the lines of, well, Amazon does it, so we should too. And I think we can get a lot of blame from things like microservices where we see big companies use it, yet we're a team of three and think we need microservices as well. Or there's the case of, well, I'm not Amazon, so I don't need that. Exactly the same kind of end of the spectrum. Everything really lies in the middle. You are similar in ways and you're not similar in ways. Context is king. Absolutely your context matters about the decisions that you make, the processes, the things that you follow. Not everything is a best practice to you. I wish as an industry we could rename best practices into maybe they're a good idea. If you have these sets of constraints, maybe you should think about it. So if it's part of a development process or some design principle, think about the trade-offs and the trade-offs within your context. If you want to chat and discuss these types of things with other software developers, you get access to my private Discord server. Links in the description on how to join. If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. If you have any other thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. And please subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.